Welcome to the FAA Safety Center, the FAA Production Studio Operation, and the National Resource Center. I'm your host, Walt Schammel. Our next presenter is a lifelong aviation enthusiast and currently is the Special Assistant to the Manager for General Aviation and Commercial Division in the FAA's Flight Standards Service in Washington. In this capacity, she has developed the FAA's online courses and has guidance documents for flight reviews, instrument proficiency checks, and weather decision making. She has authored numerous articles on risk management decision making and technically advanced aircraft. Our favorite subject today, glass cockpits. She's also works with the FAA Aviation News and she edits some of the articles in there. As co-chair of the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, she's involved with the Personal Aviation Subgroup. She also is closely involved with updates to various FAA handbooks and publications, including the Aviation Instructor's Handbook. She holds an ATP certificate, as well as ground and flight instructor certificates with instrument, single engine, multi-engine land ratings. She is a master CFI master ground instructor with the uh, National Association of Flight Instructors and she's worked as an instructor for various flight schools in Northern Virginia. She is presently instructing at the Leesburg based Flying Club and the Virginia Wing of the Civil Air Patrol where she serves as an instructor check pilot and director of standards and evaluation. She's also a member of Civil Air Patrol's National Flight Review Board. She's closely involved in the development and delivery of the G1000, Garmin 1000, transition training program for pilots seeking to fly the 1000, G1000 equipped Cessna 182s. She's a member of the National Association of Flight Instructors, the 99s, the Experimental Aircraft Association, and the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Carolina, and she now lives in Northern Virginia. She has a BA in International Relations. She's fr uh, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She has a master's degree in education from the University of Phoenix. Her work experience includes serving in the United States Department of State's Foreign as Diplomatic Service, during which she worked uh, at U.S. embassies in Panama City and over in Bangladesh. With that background, her topic today is cloudy skies, but clear judgment. Let's welcome Susan Parsons. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, and uh, I don't, I've been outside enough to know that down here there are clear skies, and it's absolutely wonderful because when uh, my flying club partner and I left uh, Northern Virginia yesterday, uh, we definitely had cloudy skies and it was uh, we, we ended up having to sit on the ground for an extra hour and a half and wait until it was time until we had enough uh, visibility and ceiling to safely depart so we could make it out here you know um, I think we all know how to get weather information and we're all really good at uh, at going to the briefing uh, getting briefings from various places um, and I don't know about you but when I first started getting uh, flight uh, weather briefings I would get it in, uh, you know, I would get these printouts from flight service and it would look sort of like this. I would come home with this big stack of paper or, or go to the deck and say, like, okay, now where do I start? And uh, so it was, it was always a little bit, um, it was a lo always a little bit challenging to do it. So I, uh, I started looking at what the FAA safety team has developed in terms of this uh, particular little, little um, 3P process, perceive, process, and perform. And they use it for a lot of different things, but I'd like for you to think about it in terms of, of these three things about weather. We're going to talk about each of these as we go along. Well, we've got perceive, what is the weather doing? Process, which is what can it do to me, because that's kind of what counts to me and my airplane. And then perform, what do I need to do in order to be safe? Now, what is the weather doing? I think, uh, like I said at the beginning, we're all pretty good. It gets drilled into us at the very beginning of flight training that we need to, uh, we need to get weather information. How many of you remember hearing that at early in your flight training? Pretty much everybody, yep. 
you, you hear that you've, you need to know what the weather is doing. And so we are, we're good at making phone calls and nowadays we have all sorts of internet resources. So we know what the weather is doing. And just here are some of the, the options that you have right now. Anybody recognize that graphic? Uh, we have Duot and Duots. Uh, Sky Vector, if anybody has seen that, flightplan.com. Uh, there's the ads on the Aviation Weather Center. Uh, there's obviously Lockheed Martin Flight Service. There are so many ways that you can go to get weather information. But it still comes down to, and by the way, I'm allowed a blonde moment. Um, it, uh, what do you do now? You know, um, and if you have any good blonde jokes after the presentation, please come and tell me. I have a world-class collection and I'm looking to add to it. Um, but uh, now that you get the information, what do you do? And it comes back to this, this great big stack of paper. So what I'd like to do today is to give you a little bit of a framework for the way that you think about weather information. We know how to get it, now we need to know how to think about it and how to put it to use in making good weather decisions. And that's where I think that, uh, that a lot of us have trouble because we, we just kind of look at this mountain of paper and say, okay, now what do I do with it? Um, I, did, I had some really good instructors along the way, by the way, but uh, like to way too many people, I've had to learn some of my lessons the hard way. How many people here have scared yourself with weather at least once? Me, yes. And I don't want to do that again. I really don't want to do that ever again. So, so it was one of the reasons that I, I decided I needed a better weather education. First thing I want to look at is, uh, if you think about it, what is it that weather can really do to you? And uh, there, you, you could fine tune it a lot, but if you really think about it, it comes down to three things. Weather can create turbulence in terms of wind and thunderstorms. So that's one thing it can do. Second thing, and this is the one we all tend to think about the most, particularly in terms of instrument flying, is it can reduce ceiling and visibility. It can create clouds and fog and rain and all of these, these other things for you. And then finally, weather can affect aircraft performance. And that is where you get into things like ice and density altitude. So, uh, and by the way, I didn't make this up. If, if anybody has read Ralph Buck's uh, weather flying book, uh, he had, he had uh, uh, some of this, this framework in here, but, but particularly these three things. And I thought it was very useful because it provides a very nice skeleton or very good framework that you can use to think about what it is or to, to make your weather decisions. And we're going to look at how. Now, I know this is weather code um, and I'm geeky enough that I still like it. I know you can get it in plain English, but I still sort of like this one. And I just put it up here because it would easily fit on one screen. Um, but if you look at however you get your weather data, notice that the order that the information is presented really kind of fits in with that turbulence, ceiling, and visibility, and performance. They're not all nice, neat categories. I recognize that some of them bleed into others, but work with me here. Um, I like to put things in boxes if I can because it makes it a little bit simpler to think about. So if you look at, at what your, your standard uh, METAR says, it, it starts off with what's the turbulence, what's the, what are the winds doing? And the second piece of information gives you information on ceiling and visibility. And the third part, uh, when you're talking about temperature, dew point, obviously that does include instrument conditions, but temperature has a lot to do to tell you things like uh, um, ice. You know, are you going to need to, or you need to get, going to need to think about that. Um, and if you look at the terminal aerodrome forecast, the TAF, it's got the same kinds of information in it. So if you can mentally um, start looking at your weather briefing data in terms of those three categories and just realize that this is how it's presented, um, that goes a long way toward helping you identify what the problems are for you. All right, what can weather do? We're going to talk about the turbulence part, gusty winds, thunderstorms. Um, by the way, I had, no animals were harmed in the making of this slide, not even humiliated. This was a Photoshop um, thing. So um, I, I do know how to erase people from photos. So if you need that done, come and see me. Uh, Photoshop is a wonderful thing. Uh, creating turbulence, gusty winds and turbulence. Now, one of the things that I'd also like for you to keep in mind as we talk through these things is the fact that when you're, deal when you're talking about weather, you need to think about the pilot and the airplane as a team. And if you fly the same airplane all the time, you've got a team that you know pretty well. But if you fly different airplanes, and I, I get in and out of a lot of different kinds of airplanes, so I have to think about what my other team member can do as well as what I can do. But I want you to think about that as we go along because 
there is never going to be necessarily a single correct answer. It's going to vary according to what you're doing right now and what airplane that you're working with right now. Now, when you think about turbulence, so we're looking at that first, we're, we're looking at two different things. We're looking at um, really primarily because um, yesterday when my flying club friend and I flew down here, we, we went through some areas where we were getting kind of bounced around quite a bit, um, those aerial potholes that we're all familiar with, but we were at 8,000 feet, so it doesn't really make as that much of a difference, except it was a little uncomfortable. Where turbulence really makes a difference um, is if, obviously if you're in something very severe, but when you get close to the ground and you're trying to land the airplane and it feels like a bucking bronco. So I would argue to you that when it comes to um, turbulence, you need to look at it as both a pilot issue and an airplane issue. Um, it's pilot proficiency. You know, how good are you at winds? How good are you at turbulence? How good are you at crosswind landings? How, how, how long ago did you practice? Because the fact that you may have, uh, you may have been really good at on, an almost direct crosswind, I hope you don't do that, at one point uh, doesn't mean that you were, you're good at it if you haven't done it in six or eight months or even six or eight weeks. So pilot proficiency is definitely an issue in thinking about your weather decision making if turbulence is out there. Now the other thing, and here's where, I, I, pilots, we all have egos. We really do. And we hate to admit that there's something that we can't do. So here's your out right here. The airplane is at fault because you have a it's, a, it's not a limitation. We know that it's, it's just the maximum demonstrated crosswind component of the airplane. But I don't know about you, but when I look at the, the book numbers for things like maximum demonstrated crosswind component, I always think about in terms of, okay, this was a test pilot who was, as they say, simulating average pilot skills. Now I'm guessing that most test pilots are, who are even simulating average pilot skills are still gonna be better than I am. So I'm not gonna, I don't really wanna go to the point that they demonstrated. So your airplane has, again, it's not a limitation, but when you look at the maximum demonstrated crosswind component, there really are things that the airplane can and can't do. And uh, has anybody besides me ever run out of rudder? You know that saying? I did this years ago in a Cessna 150. I was learning to fly from the right seat and my instructor, we, we were in a pretty rocking crosswind, and my instructor kept saying, more right rudder. That's one of those things you have to say to be a flight instructor. And finally, I said, Warren, I don't have any more right rudder. And uh, he kind of put his foot down there and, oh, okay, so let's go around again. So we go around again. And that time he says, let me take it. Have at it. He drifted worse than I did, for the record. Uh, we did get back in, and, uh, and we, we, when we landed the, the, that time, he said, I think we should park it now. I think we should. So, so we did. But uh, I have experienced the fact that the airplane can, you, you actually, no matter how good you are, you may be at the point where the airplane just doesn't have enough rudder authority to counteract the crosswind. So again, you want to think about this one in terms of what can I do and what can the airplane do? So let's look at these questions. Can the pilot and aircraft team handle the current and forecast wind conditions? That forecast part's kind of important too because uh, I can tell you about a time or two when I have departed in dead calm conditions and it hadn't been dead calm when I got there. And I've heard people say to me before sometimes, well, I'm not planning to go out and fly in this. Well, maybe you're not, but we don't always get what we plan in aviation and we don't always get the weather that we were promised by the forecasters either. So you want to think about what, what is it going to be, what is it likely to be. Now this is more for the altitude. Now, do you know the power setting for uh, maneuvering speed at the expected weight for your airplane? I mean, do, do you know how to configure it so that you can be at or below maneuvering speed when you go into, into turbulent weather? And uh, because thunderstorms always have turbulence associated with them, you also want to make sure that uh, if you're going to be, this is more the altitude than obviously the, uh, the landing, unless you're trying to land really quickly in front of a thunderstorm. Do I have the conditions and equipment uh, to avoid thunderstorm encounters? And let me say a word about Datalink here. I love Datalink. I absolutely love it. Have it on my GPS 496, and it's, it's kind of getting to be like some other technologies. I have no idea how I lived without it. The only thing is, I guess I just didn't know it was there. And once you get it, it's great. Remember that data link is not real time. 
And I have flown, there was one time coming back from a friend and a trip, and we were looking at some uh, bad weather, possibly convective weather in the area, and it was very hard, even though I knew that data link was not real time, it was very hard to look at that screen picture and not think that it was right in that place. So you have to mentally try to transpose it. And please, please do not use data link as a tactical pick my way through the weather tool. It is strategic and it's all about avoiding the stuff in the first place and not, you know, finding a way through the hole. So, because um, that's a good way to um, return to Mother Earth under conditions that you don't want to come down in. Second thing, reduce ceiling of visibility. That's the second big thing that weather can do. And this is the one we all think about. This is the reason we get a, an instrument rating. How many people have instrument ratings? Instrument flying, okay. Now, um, notice that I've got two things here that are significant. One is that there's nothing here on the airplane. Now, yeah, the, if you see a lot of airplanes out here on these showgrounds today that are not intended for instrument flight. So in that sense, it is an airplane issue. But a lot of the, the things that were likely to go rent and fly, and if you own an airplane that you travel in at all, you're going to, uh, it's, it's very likely to be an instrument equipped airplane. So, so that's kind of a given. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the airplane doesn't really care if there are clouds out there or not. The airplane doesn't see it. The airplane doesn't notice if it's uh, upside down or right side up, but you do. Um, so I, I think of the clouds, the ceiling visibility part as being primarily a pilot issue. And there are several questions that you need to be able to ask yourself here. First of all, am I instrument rated? If you're not, don't go mess with it because uh, it, uh, the, the amount of instrument training that you get in private pilot um, training, it's, it's intended to help you get out of conditions that you accidentally get into. It's not intended to give you a, a, a short and cheap instrument rating. The second thing is legally current. Now we all know what those numbers are, but being legally current, and here's the third part, being proficient, those are not all the same thing. So I, there, are, there are many times when, I, I, in fact, I can't think of any time when I haven't been legally current, but I can sure think of times when I haven't done enough and I haven't done enough, thought enough, practiced enough to feel like I was really proficient. And even now, I mean, when I, when I get more practice at it, the first few seconds when you go into a cloud from that nice blue sky, you're really having to think about and concentrate on on what you're doing. So all of these three things are very important. So let's look at uh, some of the questions to ask yourself when you're looking at that forecast and you see the little box and if you mentally transpose that ceiling and visibility on the top. Um, here are some of the questions. Can I safely fly at the planned altitudes? Uh, do I have some kind of terrain avoidance plan? And here I commend to you all kinds of things. The AOPA Air Safety Foundation they have on their website a lot of information about terrain avoidance and they, they have some, some specific terrain avoidance uh, kind of information. Very, very worthwhile. Are the ceiling and visibility good for an approach? That is, if you're going to be making an instrument approach. And uh, by the way, you know, it, it's an amazing thing that you can get an instrument rating and you're legal to shoot an approach to absolute minimums, 200 and a half. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. It really doesn't, and uh, I have, I did that once and I didn't mean to. It was one of those cases where the weather went, uh, well, let's put it this way. When I left North Carolina, the uh, ceiling and visibility were supposed to be 1,003, and by the time I got to Virginia two and a half hours later, the dullest terminal forecast was up to Amendment 5. So that was a case where, um, but, but I ended up flying to minimums and I made it obviously, but it's not something that I would deliberately have put myself in had I known that that was gonna be the case. Uh, do I need an alternate? That's the one, two, three rule. Um, and anytime you need an alternate, um, you, want to, uh, you want to make sure that it's an alternate that you can actually get to, not just one that fills the box and, and fulfills the legal requirements. Because remember, there is a category that I think of as legal but stupid. And there are a lot of things like that, but legal but dumb. And uh, stu dumb, stupid, pick, pick your term. Um, but uh, just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Now, here's a big one for any time you've got ceiling and visibility type issues. Where is the nearest good weather? 
Uh, which direction would I go? That's the first question. Is it north, south, east, or west? And then the last thing is, or question, or, or the conditions within my personal minimums. And we're going to talk about that in a few slides too. Um, Sky Vector, I love this site. Uh, it's not an official weather source. We all know that, but uh, here's why I love it. Um, anybody has anybody looked at it before? Um, the reason I like this is because you can put up a sectional chart or now an instrument chart. And you can use the little slider at the bottom to see the entire chart on one page. And that's useful for flight planning. But the other useful thing, look at those little circles. See the little green circles on there? You can put up um, what it will do is superimpose on top weather um, information for all the airports. Now, all the, the, the various manufacturers are still trying to, uh, they still kind of go between blue means one thing in one place and green another, in another. But basically, yellow, red, and, green, and uh, magenta, those are not colors that you really want to play with a lot. Blues and greens are pretty good. Magentas and reds, not so much. Yellow, you've got to think about it, is, is one way to, uh, to look at it. But if you look at this, you'll see a lot of circles in there green. And in this particular scheme, green means good VFR. So I can look at this sectional chart, and I can tell in one glance what the weather is in the entire, in the entire sectional chart. Now here's, here's another tip that I use. This is, for my, this is my personal you know, planning, but, um, but, but let me offer it to you for what, for what it's worth. One of the places that I start when I'm doing flight planning for VFR or for IFR is I have a look at this, and I scale out the chart that I'm going to use so that I can see the entire sectional chart on a single screen. And I have a look at it to see what the colors are on the weather. Now I think of this sectional chart as for, for most light general aviation aircraft and for most human physiology, if you know what I'm saying, uh, think of the sectional chart as your box. This is your operating box. Your airplane, now granted if you start on the edge of a chart, you can go off to another chart, but if you think of this as, as the box that you can operate in comfortably, both aeronautically and physiologically, uh, it's useful. Now, if I see, like on this particular one, most of these little circles are open green circles, so that's basically telling me it's clear VFR all over this region, so I don't really have a whole lot to worry about. But on the other hand, take a look at this one. Um, see the reds and magentas? Red is IFR and magenta is low IFR. Uh, this one uses blue for marginal VFR. And uh, by the way, another thing you can do is move your mouse over the station model and it will tell you, it, it'll give you the forecast or the METAR, whichever, or it gives you both if it provides it for that particular station. So what I do, you know, I look at this and I say, hmm, okay, um, this is pretty ugly. And if I were to launch in this, where, you know, I remember a second ago I said, where's the nearest good weather? Well. On this particular chart, and I, I blew it up a little bit so that you could see, uh, instead of looking at the whole thing, but in this particular section of the chart that we're looking at, there isn't. There's one little spot there that's blue, and that's marginal VFR, but uh, if you're looking at everything else that's red and magenta, come on, I mean, we're all optimists, but how long do you really think that that blue, that blue circle is going to stay a blue circle before it gets to be a red circle or a magenta circle? And by the way, the filled circles, that means overcast. Um, so if it's open, it's clear, and if it's, if it's filled, it's overcast, and then they have the, the fractions in between. So, so this is a great tool to look at and see right from the very beginning, do I need to go any further? Give you another example. A couple years ago, um, the friend who flew down with me yesterday, he and I were going to go flying around on New Year's Day. We were going to start the new, the new year outright. And it, was, it had rained overnight. And it was supposed to get better. Emphasis on supposed to. But as is so often the case, it kind of didn't. So I, was, I pulled up this and I started looking at it. And through the entire northern, uh, the Baltimore, Washington, um, or the Washington sectional, which I was looking at, it was all red and magenta. There were no signs of blue or green anywhere. And I forget who called whom, but we kind of said, uh, I don't think we're doing this today. No. Because there was really no easy place that we could get to. So you want to know, first of all, is there good weather? Second of all, which direction it is? And then here's the big one, can I get to it? Because fuel is always an issue. And if there's good weather, I mean, if you look out and there's good weather, you know, 500 miles away, okay, but can you get that far? 
So those are just kind of some of the things that you want to keep in mind as you go through this. Third is what can weather do reduce aircraft performance? And here we're talking about ice and density altitude. Now, here is the ultimate golden out for pilots and egos. This is definitely the airplane's fault because uh, there are certain, if you look at the performance charts in your airplane, and again, please bear in mind that these are done under, the, under controlled and really best possible conditions, uh, not necessarily the kind that we fly in, and they're usually done with new airplanes. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't get to fly new airplanes all that often. Some of the ones that I've been in have been beaten up pretty hard by student pilots, just like I was. Um, I did not always do excellent landings, and in fact, unfortunately, I still don't. I try. But uh, air, it can reduce aircraft performance. So if, you, if you're looking at issues where you have either thunderstorms with a lot of turbulence implied in them, or if you're looking at a situation where you have um, density altitude issues, high altitude, high temperatures, high humidity, any of those things, uh, this, there may be conditions in which the airplane simply cannot do what you need it to do. And this is where you can tell those passengers or anybody that you need to tell, including yourself, I can do it, but the airplane can't. Sorry. The, the airplane just cannot climb. It can't carry what we're asking it to carry. It can't go where we need it to go. Um, and uh, so an air, aircraft capability is an enormous issue for us here. Um, now, I fly in what uh, some folks out west would consider to be flat lands. I don't consider it to be perfectly flat. The Appalachians are quite lovely, thank you very much. But, you know, it's not really high altitude terrain. So our density altitudes, for us, a, a, high, a de high density altitude means about two or 3,000 feet in the summertime. But out west, <laughs> we're talking about that's, that's field elevation, and then you get uh, a little bit higher than that. It starts moving up. So. Anyway, there, there, I know that there are airports where you can only go in one direction and out the other, and there are certain times of the day that you're not going to fly. But here's where you really need to be familiar with your aircraft and its performance characteristics and what it can do and can't do, uh, because we've all heard the stories and occasionally even seen uh, videos and pictures of people who've tried to take off in high density altitude conditions and just simply you know, didn't, didn't have the aircraft performance to do it. So here are some of the questions to ask yourself. And it's all part of basic good pre-flight planning. OK, what's the aircraft performance? What, what can I expect from it? What are the takeoff and landing distances? Because remember that if you have high density altitude, it's going to affect your takeoff distance and your landing distance. And uh, I occasionally have people I'm flying with or doing check flights for uh, I'll have them um, take, do an intersection takeoff. Now, I know full well, I'm not going to ask them to do it until, unless I'm absolutely sure that the airplane can do it, but there's one particular place I like to go, and it's a shorter runway. It's still way long by, by a lot of standards, but it's shorter than they're used to, and they, they're looking and seeing some trees at the end. And that's where you start thinking, oh, hmm, maybe I really do need to do these performance calculations. Um, and then what about climb and cruise performance? Uh, cruise, you know, that, let's assume you're at altitude. Now, you need to know that because that obviously gets into fuel burn and other issues. But climb, if you're looking to out-climb terrain or obstacles, you need to care. And you need to know. And so that's, that's, those are sort of the things that you need to look at. Another thing is the forecast freezing level. Um, there is not a general aviation airplane I know there are a lot of, uh, of airplanes nowadays that are coming out with, that are certificated for flight into known icing, and there are other airplanes that have uh, ice protection. But for many of us, we're still flying airplanes that don't have those capabilities. And frankly, there are some icing capabilities that no airplane, no matter what its system is, they just can't do it. And ice is, uh, ice belongs in drinks, like uh, margaritas, for example. Uh, ice does not belong on airplanes because it's a very surefire recipe for one of those quick returns to Mother Earth, and you don't want to do that. So, so when you're looking at your, um, now when I, I was talking about the, um, I showed you the earlier slide where we looked at METARs and TAFs, and if the surface temperatures are pretty close to freezing, what happens to the temperature as you, as you climb? It goes down, generally speaking. So if it's already freezing at, or close to freezing, 
when you're on the ground and you're going to be climbing, and particularly if you're going to be climbing to, into a cloud, here's where you really need to start thinking about what the freezing level is and am I equipped for it and what is my escape route? Gets back to that, where's the good weather? Where are there no clouds? Where, where can I go? Um, there are a lot of advisory, and please let me emphasize advisory, tools nowadays. Um, if you don't know about ADS, Aviation Digital Data Service Weather on um, NOAA's website, it's a great site to look at. They have a lot of useful information, including there is an icing tool, and again, it's advisory. The idea is to start giving you a place to start. It's not something that you can take and write into stone as, as this is what I can absolutely do. Um, but but there, you can specify the altitude and the place that you are, and it will show you where the forecast uh, or the potential for icing is greatest. So part of what I, I want to get across to you is use all the tools at your disposal. We have an unprecedented, more than any other generation of pilots has ever had, probably an unprecedented amount of information available to us. And so part of it is, is what I'd like you to carry away with you is there's a lot of stuff out there to look at, but the second piece is what we've been talking about. Try to look at it in terms of these three boxes that we're talking about and the pilot aircraft team, and that will allow you to make the most and the best use of the information that's available to us now. Okay, uh, personal minimums, what are they? Because um, I, I mentioned that in an earlier slide, and I do want to spend some time talking about this because this is one of those things that I heard about from the get-go. Uh, and I had no idea what to do with that. Personal minimums, oh yeah, hmm, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but what do I do? How do I do that? And so I'm going to offer you a, a little, you know, I, I actually do a whole seminar on personal minimums, and we're not going to do that today, but I want to give you some ideas to, to start with here. Here is an official definition of, uh, and by official I mean I Googled it like everybody else. I, if you Google personal minimums, it's amazing what will come up. So I uh, Googled it and then I distilled it into this. It's an individual set, uh, pilot set of procedures, rules, criteria, and guidelines for deciding whether and under what conditions to operate or continue operating. Nothing wrong with that, perfectly good definition, but it sounds kind of abstract, at least it did to me. And I don't do abstraction very well. I'm a concrete kind of person. So I, I thought about it for a while and I came up with another one. And remember this image. Uh, this is a guy fueling an airplane. Uh, we're all familiar with fuel reserve requirements, yes? Uh, what are they? Thir yep, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Now, uh, just a quick uh, word on that. 30 and 45 minutes for fuel, that, those are the rock bottom bare minimums. I don't like to do that. An hour is, is as low as I would ever care to go. But anyway, the idea of a fuel reserve is this is the fuel that you're not ever supposed to have to use. That this is the buffer that if you really, 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 really got in a pinch, you've got it, but you're not ever supposed to plan to use that reserve fuel. Okay, now personal minimums, if you think about it, it's kind of the same thing, it's the same concept. I think of it as a safety reserve between the skills, and remember the pilot aircraft team here, between the skill, skills and the aircraft performance that are required for the specific flight you want to make and the skills and aircraft performance available to you through training, experience, currency, and proficiency, and of course, aircraft, aircraft performance capability. And uh, by the way, I apologize, I was about to go into my North Carolina twang there for a second. I have real problems with words that have I-L-L, -L. I go eel, I tend to make them skills. Um, but anyway, uh, skills and aircraft performance. So think, keep, keep this definition in mind. This is part, part of what you're trying to do with personal minimums. You want to develop something that's going to give you that, that performance equivalent of a fuel reserve. Now, criteria. Prefab versus custom built. Now, if you go look up, there, there are a lot of charts out there that'll tell you how to develop personal minimums, and I, I just came up with the prefab versus custom built because I, I like this idea, but... Uh, there, there are a lot of things they'll say, okay, if you have, and, and this is something that we pilots are very vulnerable to. We like numbers, and we like precision, and we like charts, and we like being able to go, okay, this, 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 and this, okay, there, there's the answer. Well, this how it requires actually a little bit more thinking, and uh, we're, we're actually pretty good at that too, but we don't do it as easily as we do looking at, at charts and graphs. But, but there is often a temptation to look at things in terms of, okay, I have 5,000 hours, I don't, I wish I did, 
but I have this many hours and I have this many approaches and so therefore I should be able to do X, Y, and Z. But really that's not the issue. What, what, you, what you have done in the past, you know, however distant that was, it's useful in terms of a foundation but what's really more important is what have you done, it's that proficiency thing we were talking about with instrument flying. What have you done recently and comfortably? Not what's the scariest thing I ever survived without bending an airplane. Um, I've done those too. Okay, so custom built per per personal minimums tailored to individual training experience, currency and proficiency with all the things that we've just been talking about. The, the weather buckets, the categories. Ceiling of visibility, winds, performance, and all the characteristics of the pilot aircraft team. Because you always have to consider what, not just what I can do, but what the airplane can do too. Um, okay, and if you're gonna think about building your personal minimums, um, like I said, I do a seminar on this, and I'm gonna run you through a, a, some of the steps really quickly. But the first one is to look at what your experience and currency actually are. Now, the reason it, it, it doesn't, I'm not trying to denigrate the idea that if you've got a lot of experience, it's worthless, because that's not the case. It was like at one point, um, Walt mentioned that uh, I, I lived in Bangladesh for two years, and the uh, State Department taught me to speak Bengali, and at one point I was actually pretty good at it. And somewhere buried back in my brain, it's still there, and I could scrape off the rust and probably get to be reasonably good at it again, but right now, uh-uh. And so what, uh, if you have a lot of training and experience in aircraft, you've got a lot of basic and good foundation to work with, but you might have to, to scrape some rust off. And part of this exercise, this part of the exercise, in looking at your training, your current training, total experience and recent experience, is to try to give you an idea of where you are and how much, how much uh, of that scraping off the rust work might you have to do at some point, or when, when you actually want to work with personal minimums. Second part, um, this, uh, I have this on a worksheet and you can download it from the library at faasafety.gov if you want to. Uh, it's actually a, a worksheet that you can use to develop your personal minimums and to record it. Um, but it includes this little graphic, so, um, and th this is useful in, in kind of defining what are the conditions, uh, VFR, marginal VFR, IFR, and low IFR. And remember what I said earlier about the, the conventions on what blue is and what green is or shifting? Uh, some of the online da weather data link use uh, the blue for VFR and green for uh, marginal VFR and other places it's reversed. So just make sure that you understand when you're looking at weather data information what the definitions are. M look at the legend is what I'm saying. Um, so now the, this, the next uh, step that you would take in doing your personal minimums is to look at what it is, what is your experience and comfort level. And when I'm doing this with people I'm doing flight reviews for and other things, I always say, well, look, you don't have to fill out every square. In fact, you probably shouldn't. Under that low IFR piece, will I deliberately go into low instrument conditions? Absolutely not. And, and personal minimums are about making some of your decisions in advance of when you actually have to think about doing something. So would I, so I don't have any personal minimums for low IFR because I'm not gonna deliberately go there. Uh, the same thing is true from the marginal VFR in my part of the country. I, I live in Northern Virginia. And in Northern Virginia in the summer, it gets pretty hazy. And if you're not comfortable flying in what are legally defined as marginal VFR conditions, you're probably not gonna be flying a whole lot. So, but, but the nice thing is that I've been flying in that particular airspace for a long time. I know where all the rocks are. And I know where all the airplane stickers are too. You know where, what airplane stickers are? All those radio towers and cell phone towers, I call them airplane stickers. So I know where they all are. I, and I, I do keep an eye out because they keep popping up all over the place. But if you know where the rocks are and you know you, you kind of get used to this as being somewhat normal in certain circumstances, it, you can do that. Because I'm, I've got recency, proficiency, and a certain comfort level with that. Would I do marginal VFR at night, even in my home airspace? Thank you, no. I don't want to do that. Uh, I would rather go IFR. So I don't, when I fill this out for myself, I have some stuff in the VFR, I have some stuff in day marginal VFR and then day and night IFR, but I don't have anything in the low IFR and the night marginal VFR boxes. So again, this, this is a little bit of that thinking exercise. What is it that you are 
comfortable and proficient in doing. And yours is going to be different from everybody else's in the room. Second thing is, remember we talked about winds and turbulence. Okay, what are, you know, what's, the, what's the most that you have done comfortably and recently? And again, this does not mean what's the strongest crosswind I've ever landed in without bending the airplane. Uh, or what's the most white knuckle thing I've ever done. And I, I had one like this. There was one time I was coming back from North Carolina after a cold front had passed. And I was getting hammered over the ridges. And there was a lot of mountain wave turbulence. And I was thinking, this landing is going to be kind of interesting, I'll bet. And I got a little closer to Leesburg. And uh, I'm listening, and not too many people are flying. Hmm. OK. Uh, I guess I'm going to have the airport mostly to myself. And so I called out a few miles out to the uh, Unicom. And, and the guy who was working at the time, he had one of these big, booming, wonderful radio announcer's voices. Oh, 7-1 Romeo, welcome home. You want the winds? I said, yeah. And Leesburg has runway 17 and 35. The, run, the winds were 280 at 16, gusting to 26. Oh. So here's where I start channeling my instructor's voice. You know, he starts telling me, I, I start hearing this guy's voice, just like I hope all of the people I fly with, I hope they hear my voice in their heads. I really do, uh, with all the, the good stuff that I've told them. But I was hearing his voice telling me how to think about it and how to work the crosswind and do this. So, so I had already decided, I, I'd mentally done a catalog of all the other airports in the area, so I knew where, uh, where I could go as an alternate. So I said, okay, I'm not going to use flaps and because this is going to be pretty gusty and I'm going to do this and I've got a long runway so I'm not going to worry about how long it's going to take me to get down. I'm just going to use every foot of it if I need to and I'm going to try it once and if I don't make it once I'm going to go to this other airport because it's more aligned with the wind, blah, blah, blah. So all the way down I was hearing, you know, my knuckles were white, I'll tell you, I, I'll admit to that and I was really fiercely concentrating on making this happen. And I did get it down, and I have to tell you this little story, because uh, one of the instructors, kind of a tough guy, he came out after me and says, great landing, great landing, 9.5. All right, I'll take that, but I want to know why you docked me 0.5. You smoked a tire. Well, yeah, but I didn't bend anything, and I didn't break the airplane. So anyway, 9.5 is the best I've ever done on a graded landing from the, uh, the tough crowd out there. Uh, the other piece of this story is that I had come back from, uh, I had had an expedition to clear out some things from my childhood bedroom. And in the right seat of the airplane was a giant teddy bear. And I had to wait until all those guys at the airport kind of dissipated from discussing my landing before I could go retrieve my teddy bear and carry it across the ramp because I wasn't going to do that after that. You know, I had done this cool pilot landing and I was not going to mess that up by carrying a teddy bear across the ramp. I remember that day. Um, but I want you to, you know, when you're thinking about these things, um, I could, so I could tell you, yeah, I landed successfully too in, in pretty much a, a gusty, almost direct crosswind. Would I have done that deliberately, you know, if I had known in advance that those winds were going to come up to that? No. That was another one of those amended forecast things. Um, so, so this is not what you have been, you've, you've survived, it's what you have thrived on, what you've done comfortably. And then the last thing, uh, you want to look at uh, performance and comfort level, shortest runway, highest terrain, highest density altitude. I already told you that in my part of the country it's actually fairly, uh, fairly tame in a lot of ways. We have uh, visibility issues, but we don't have particularly high mountains, we don't have particularly nasty density altitudes. But uh, I have acquired a great liking for Arizona, and it's a little different out there. So I'm going to have to learn a few extra lessons about density, altitude, and, and, uh, and operating in different circumstances. So, so these are the, the things that you want to look at. And again, you don't feel like you have to fill out all the squares. Sometimes we do. Um, but I, I, I put it down in different ways, like single engine, multi-engine, and make and model, so that you have a different uh, you, you have uh, a different ways to look at it and think about it. Because it, it still gets back to the pilot aircraft team. And here's one way to think about that. You may be super pilot, but if you're flying a super cub, you still got some limits. And you may be flying the latest G-Whiz bang technology, and I, and I love flying the G-1000 stuff, 
But just because it looks like an airliner up front, it's still bolted into a general aviation aircraft, a general aviation airframe. So there are still things that you can't do. And, and here's where that team thing comes in too. You can be the greatest pilot in the world, but you can't make up for what the airplane can't do. And you can be flying the greatest airplane in the world, but believe me, the airplane can't make up for what you can't do either. So you got to be working together here. Okay, the next step is you put it all together, and uh, I call these baseline personal minimums. You put it together and, okay, what, what do all these numbers and, and these personal minimums look like together? And uh, then you want to adjust for other conditions. Now, these, are, are, these came out of my head, so you should be suspicious immediately. Um, but, but these are, are just some of the things that you want to adjust for. If you, uh, as a pilot, you have, uh, you're tired or you've had a stressful day, you're flying an airplane that you don't know, uh, you are going to a place that you're not familiar with, uh, or you've got some kind of external pressures, like your boss is upset with you or you've got to be someplace, here's where you're going to want to adjust your personal minimums to, in a more conservative direction. And I just came up with some, you know, some ideas. So you can see this pretty quickly where this is going, because if you had two of these conditions, uh, or three, let's say that uh, I'm, I'm getting a cold and I'm trying to make a trip and I want to go after work and the airplane that I usually fly isn't available, you can see pretty quickly that my baseline personal minimums are going to have to be adjusted pretty considerably if I follow these rules. And it may mean that I don't go. But that's the point. You, you have, you, this is a way to give yourself a framework to make the decisions in advance so that if it's not appropriate to go, you don't go. Now, I, I did this seminar once and I had a gentleman stick up his hand and say, hey, yeah, I, I do that. And he said, here's, here's how I think about it. He said, I add 1,000 feet uh, for each, for my children and 500 feet for my wife. Really? Does she know that? We all took a vow of silence. Um, and I said, okay, um, Whatever works for you, pick it, you know, whatever, whatever makes a difference for you, but uh, that gentleman shall remain nameless because I don't think his wife knew that she somehow got a few fewer points on the personal minimums than his kids. Um, but just pick something and pick something that you can work with and that's easy for you. Uh, I have another theory about flight instruction. You know, Baskin Robbins, they have 31 flavors. Pick one. They're all good. So I call it the Baskin-Robbins theory of risk management and decision making. There are at least 31 ways to do it, maybe a lot, really lots more. Pick one, and you don't even have to stick with a single one, although I happen to have a favorite. If you need to bribe me, it's pistachio almond. Personal minimums, are they carved in stone once you do it? And yes, I know that's a wood chisel that has been pointed out to me multiple times, but I took some poetic license here, and Photoshop is a wonderful thing. So I used a wood chisel on stone. Um, so are they carved in stone? Can you, can you change your personal minimums? Uh, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Remember the idea is the safety buffer between the skills and performance required and the skills and performance that you have available. And if you want to stretch, here's what I like to think about. First of all, you want to gain experience with what you already know how to do. I'm used to flying in, you know, mar marginal VFR in my area, something under five miles, visibility. Okay, one day it's four miles. Well, you know, I don't have anything else going on particularly, so yeah, okay, I, maybe I can stretch it a little bit because I, I don't have anything else. Reassess and review. Okay, what did I learn from this? Um, be reflective. It sounds like one of those squishy academic words, but it's actually useful. Uh, modify with care. You always want to, uh, to, to be careful and thoughtful about what you do. Now, here are some rules to live by. No matter how much you and your passengers moan, scream, and cry, and groan. I, uh, I wouldn't want this kid in the back of my airplane, by the way. He would, be, he would definitely not be in my personal minimums. Okay. Never, ever lower your personal minimums in order to make a specific flight. You have if you do that, you've just defeated the purpose of having them in the first place. You don't, if you're going to think about stretching, which is a different, store, a different idea, you need to think about that in advance and say, okay, you know, this is what I've got and you know, this is what I think I can do. The second is keep all the other variables constant. Um, you don't want to be, 
You don't want to be trying to stretch yourself in terms of ceiling visibility and turbulence and uh, per aircraft performance and your capabilities all at the same time. Think about this in a scientific way. We're good at this. Um, do one thing at a time. Just do, work on one thing at a time. And if you've got two or three out there, no, that's already below your personal minimum, so don't do it. Third is, and here's where we instructors come in handy, talk through your plans. You know, call somebody up and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking about doing. And one of the things that I do when I'm doing flight reviews is, what are your goals? And your goals don't have to be to get another certificate or rate, and your goals might be, I want to get more comfortable flying in certain conditions. And uh, most every instructor I know would be most happy to help you do that, um, because that's, that's, after all, what we're here for. And you don't get to be an instructor unless you love flying and you want to do it. Okay. Don't cut into your skill reserve. Don't get Just like we don't cut into the fuel reserve, you don't cut into your skill reserve. Um, I can't remember where this airport is, but I thought this was a really cool picture. And what it says to me is, yeah, this is not something that I would really go doing for the first time all by myself. And a lot of people have talked to me because they know that I'm interested in Arizona. Oh, you ought to try Sedona. Well, they call it the USS Sedona for a reason. It's an airport on top of a mesa, and you look at it going, there's an end and there's an end, and gosh, I would love to do it, but for the first time by myself, not so much. That's something that I would want to do with somebody who knew what they were doing and could, could help me learn how to do it. So, you know, don't cut into your skill reserve, particularly when there, there's something that you're not familiar with or comfortable with doing. Do not go to the unusable fuel level of your aircraft performance or piloting ability. You know, that scraping the bottom of the barrel when you're on empty and desperately hoping that the engine will not die. And I'll tell you a little story. Yesterday, in, in departing from Leesburg, I forgot to hit the button to reset. We have one of these JPI engine analyzers, and if you don't reset it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't know where to start calculating on fuel. Now, we knew full well that we had full tanks and a lot of range and everything else, but it is a creepy thing when you're machine starts yelling at you about you've got five minutes of fuel left. <laughs> I hate that. And every time I, I've done it a couple of times, and I swear every time I'm never going to forget that again because I know I've got a lot of fuel, but I keep looking back there to see if I'm leaving a contrail. Um, no. You know, did I leave a fuel cap off or something? No. It, I just, that was uh, operator error. But anyway, don't, don't take yourself to that white knuckle, I survived this level of your ability in whatever you're doing, aircraft performance or weather or anything else. And the last thing is stick to the plan. Absolutely stick to the plan. This is where you have to have discipline. Um, I remember reading something many years ago to the effect that um, you, you become pilot in command the day that you say no to a flight that you or somebody else really wanted you to make. And that's true, because it's real easy. It's really hard to say no when you're sitting on the ground. It's really easy to say yes, but that reverses really quickly if you decide to take off, and you're up there wishing that you were down there and that you had made that tough decision while you still were in a better condition to do it. So if, if you do it, show, your, show people your, your personal minimums and tell you, I'm about keeping you safe, and this is what I do. And uh, this is how I do it. Now, another thing, and I, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I have a, a dirty little trick that I play, or not play, but I use. When I'm doing, uh, occasionally I do um, right seat pilot seminars for people who fly with pilots but don't fly themselves. I talk to them about personal minimums and encourage them to tell, talk to the pilot about what, what are your personal minimums. And if you're nervous about flying and you're in the right seat and you're not a pilot yourself, well, for goodness sakes, you know, tell, tell the pilot, okay, I want to see what your personal minimums are, and I want you to tell me how these conditions are within your personal minimums. Then I'll get in the airplane and go with you. So, so this is, you know, it's partly about bringing your, your passengers and everybody else into the safety decision with you. Don't let anybody do this, uh, this business with you about, well, you just spent so many thousand dollars on an instrument rating, and you mean we can't go into a simple little cloud? Don't fall for that. This is why you need to get people in with your personal minimums. And the last thing, I'm just going to put these up here, and you can think about it. Would you go? Uh, there are people who would say yes, and there are people who would say no. Um, it's mostly marginal VFR, but, and you can see if you look up toward the northwestern corner of this particular slide, that you're starting to get some IFR and marginal VFR coming in. But around here, you've got a lake to think about. You've got marginal conditions in a lot of places. Um, a lot depends on what are you flying, 
why are you flying? What are you comfortable with? What have you done recently? You know, whether or not you can actually do it. Um, and here's the way, you know, I, I blew this one up a little bit if you can't see it. It says two and a half miles, light snow, few at 1,200, overcast at 27, et cetera. Um, and look at how much uh, red and magenta there is. Would you go? I wouldn't. This is not something I'd want to play with because, first of all, there's a big body of water there called one of the Great Lakes. And uh, there is clearly some bad weather, and I don't see too much good. Now, if I were working off that northwest corner and headed in a different direction, that's a different story. But if I were trying to fly somewhere around the lakes, not really. This one, yeah, that's pretty obvious. And then I just want to show you, right before I close here, once again, think about this turbulence, ceiling, and visibility, and performance. If you can try when you're looking at all that mountain of weather data that you get from so many different sources now, and just try to ask yourself the questions that we talked about in these boxes, I think it will give you a much more, um, a much more workable and practical way to think about it and then to make a good weather decision so that you can all, you know, we can all turn up at events like this and enjoy aviation. Because as I was saying to my friend this morning as we were driving out here, I get crabby if I don't fly often. I really do. Um, between that and my coffee, I mean, there are just certain things that I have to have in life, and flying is one of them. And uh, so I want to be around to do it for a long time, and I want you to be around to do it for a long time, too. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to get in touch with me, there's my email address. Please do not pluralize me. It scares people. A lot of people want to put an S on the end of my last name. Uh, it is singular, and uh, it's, e it's better if we keep it that way. And uh, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. How about some questions from the group? I can do that. Are there any questions? Well, thank you very much, Susan. Very interesting. Thank you. A lot of that good review stuff, and uh, we used to laugh about, I don't know what you're checking the weather for, we're going anyway, and we've known a lot of accidents from exactly Absolutely. that attitude. Absolutely, we have. So it's very important to check it and to know what you're looking for and what you're doing and, and to know how to think about it. And unlike the Coast Guard, when we go out, we want to come back. We absolutely want to come back. I think they do too. They sure do now, but that's the plaque that was in the headquarters building uh -huh. that said you don't have to come back, but you do have to go out. But you do have to go out. Well, we, another way to think about it is there are no emergency takeoffs. Um, there are emergency landings, but uh, we don't, unless somebody's shooting at you, and in most, for most of us that's really not the case, there aren't any emergency takeoffs. Well, I don't carry any congressmen in the airplane anymore. Why not? They were shooting at them. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, you must have been going in some very interesting parts of the world then. Well, you all come back in another hour. We have Dan Seeley. Oh, we have a question. Go ahead. 